are very happy to introduce you today to Dr. Stephen Brown. He's a radiobiologist at Henry Ford Cancer Center in Michigan, and he's been teaching with RCC since our very beginning. So he's kind of one of our founding educators, and his expertise is in the radiobiology of hypofractionation. So what better person to introduce you today in this course of hypofractionation than Stephen Brown. So Stephen Brown, we're very happy to have you and to greet you from all of the countries in Latin America. And we look forward to learning from you and having a great session today. Feel free to share to begin your presentation and I'll be helping moderate questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Benjamin and the organizers. Maria and Carolyn, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk about the radiobiology of hypofractionation. I'm at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and it's a pleasure being transmitted across the globe <laughs> to speak to you. And uh, Dr. Brown, if you want to uh, launch the slideshow. Yes, mm -hmm. try this again. Perfect. Great. It looks good. Good. I'm just having trouble uh, going to the next slide. So I'm <laughs> going to minimize this. Here we go. Can you see my slides now? Try by clicking this button down here in the in the bottom. Do you see this? Or where the yeah. red arrow is? Yes, but there's nothing there to click. Let's see. It says I'm sharing. You are sharing. You see. Um, can you click slideshow? You there. see my slides? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry about that. Perfect. So the objectives of the talk are to answer the questions, what happens under biologically altered fractionation schemes? Why a shorter treatment time like hyperfractionation or accelerated, accelerated fractionation might achieve a similar or even better tumor control. What's the radiobiology governing response to high dose per fraction? And what research areas may change the field in the future? And here I'm talking about flash radiation. I want to review the mechanisms at a cellular level, molecular level, so to review classical radiobiology and the concepts that govern radiation cell killing, I want to review what I consider a new biology that's needed to explain why hypofractionation works. And then also point in the future what directions uh, may be changing in the field. My outline is shown here where I'll cover the four or maybe five R's of radiobiology, <clears throat> repair, reassortment of cells in the cell cycle, sometimes called redistribution, reoxygenation, repopulation, and more recently, radiosensitivity. And then the new biology governing high-dose radiation some people think there's a direct vascular injury. There may be indirect damage to the vasculature. The immune system may play a role. There may be other mechanisms not yet identified. And then finally, future directions. So to jump right in, radiation generates free radicals. <clears throat> These are short-lived. They interact with the biomolecules. And since water is the most abundant component of the cell, mostly we're talking about interaction with water. This has no consequence because water is hydrolyzed and then comes back to being water. Um, but if those free radicals interact with other more important molecules like DNA, then damage can occur. So if the radiation directly interacts with radiation, a small percentage of this occurs, maybe 20%, or indirectly with water that then causes free radicals, 
that then damages DNA, that's where the consequence happens. And the distances we're talking about are two nanometers on that order, uh, which means the free radicals don't travel far. And this has implications for flash radiation. So one of the most important mechanisms governing the response of radiation is cellular repair. At low doses, radiation cell killing is due to double strand breaks. Those are lethal because most single strand breaks can be repaired 95 plus percent. If we plot the surviving fraction as a function of dose, at the low radiation doses, cell survival as a function of dose follows the relationship shown here. Not much cell kill, but if it does happen, it's because of a double strand break. And so the surviving fraction is proportional to the dose given because the radiation is killing the cells through double strand breaks. At higher radiation doses, radiation cell killing is a consequence of accumulated DNA damage due to multiple single strand breaks or multiple DNA repair, DNA damage like pair deletions. And that's shown here with the, the quadratic term. Surviving fraction is proportional to dose squared since cell death is a consequence of two single strand breaks. And interestingly, this effect that happens on a cellular level has clinical impl implications since we can fit the data to a linear quadratic curve and the components alpha over beta uh, have clinical implications. At very high doses, radiation cell killing is even more complex and an area of active research. But the majority of radiation doses typically encountered follow this relationship. Surviving fraction, SF, is equal to E, to the minus alpha d minus beta d squared, where d is dose and alpha and beta are the uh, coefficients which govern response. This is shown graphically in more detail. On the left, a linear curve. On the right, a semi-log plot of the same data showing the alpha component, direct cell kill because of double strand breaks and the beta component. And here approximately four gray is uh, the dose where the component due to double strand breaks is approximately equal to that due to single strand breaks. And Stephen, in the last slide, I, I found this very helpful that when we're talking about alpha beta of a certain tumor, it's on this graph where we see that the alpha component of cell death is equal to the beta component of cell death. These are the same size. And so tracing this down, you get to a number that's the dose. And the units of alpha beta is gray. And so this tells you what the alpha beta is. In this case, the alpha beta is like 4.2. Thank you, Benjamin. Typically, that's a testable question when we hear the <laughs> operational definitions. Damage is damage. But in the 1960s, 70s, there were two types of damage that were identified. Uh, but these were the same mechanistically. It's just that Eric Hall, who wrote the Bible of Radiobiology uh, textbook, demonstrated potentially lethal damage, that if you change a cell's environment soon after radiation, you might think that the happy cells in a new environment would do better, but it actually uh, made it worse. The cells felt pretty good, but they were damaged, and so they died. And he termed that potentially lethal damage. Or uh, if it's repaired, then of course the repair of potentially lethal damage. 
And it refers to cells in a dish where you change the environment. I don't think it has a lot of clinical implication other than you might think that if blood flow and new nutrients come to a tumor, that you might have a condition where you're changing the environment of the cells that were just irradiated and you might cause more damage. It's never been shown experimentally, although in my lab using hyperthermia, we can increase blood flow and we do get more damage. Um, another type of damage, again, molecularly, the same molecules are, are in play, is termed sublethal damage. And this is where two radiation doses are separated in time. And the more time between the doses, the more time for repair. And so you can imagine how two doses of radiation can affect survival. That's termed sublethal damage, or if it's repaired, then the repair of sublethal damage. These are just operational and testable definitions. Quite important to note that the kinetics of repair are one to two hours, a half-life. Uh, meaning if you wait one day, it's all repaired, and that's why we fractionate. Uh, the different phases of the cell cycle have different repair capacities. Obviously, when you're in S phase and the DNA is all opened, you have a better chance to repair what damage has occurred than if you're in late G2 or M phase and the cells are about to divide with that damage intact. Consequently, cells in late G2 or M mitosis are preferentially killed and cells in S phase are preferentially spared. Because of this, a radiation dose will alter the proportion of cells in the phases of the cell cycle. And if you time the radiation just right, these synchronized cells will die more. And I'll show that graphically. Not a major impact during hypofractionation because uh, the dose is so high. And the advantage that we're trying to get is not biologically, but physically, uh, focusing the radiation onto the target. So these concepts are shown here, uh, focus on uh, the high dose, acute high dose rate radiation, where there's a shoulder region and a straight line portion. And as repair becomes more important, the curve shifts to this less damage. And then redistribution or reassortment of cells in the cell cycle can push the curve back towards the axes. And then obviously, if the cells are proliferating, another R of radiobiology, repopulation, then uh, even less damage is done. And then reoxygenation. Obviously, oxygen is the most potent radiation sensitizer. Having a factor of two to three, meaning in the presence of oxygen, it takes two to three times less radiation to do the damage. It has two consequences. The free radicals that are formed in the presence of oxygen are more damaging, and the damage that occurs is made permanent. Cancer cells, even the width of a hair from a blood vessel, are deprived of oxygen, since oxygen can only diffuse 100 microns or so uh, because the cells that are close to the vessel consume the oxygen. This is a vascular cast of mouse tissue. On the left is muscle, and it shows what was once muscle troughs surrounded by capillaries. Wherever you look in the normal tissue, there's a regular repeating structure and the tissue is very well oxygenated. 
The same magnification is shown on the right for tumor, and it looks completely different. There's large vessels, there's strange loops in the vasculature, and there's regions of improper filling of the contrast of the acrylic material that was used. And so they're under high pressure. One word to describe this strange tumor vasculature, abnormal tumor vasculature, is chaotic. And you can see why oxygen is often reduced in a tumor compared to normal tissue. A fractionated radiation consisting of small doses allows for reoxygenation. And if you wait one day, capillary vessels can grow about a millimeter a day, reoxygenating those previously hypoxic cancer cells. Reoxygenation can occur between hypofractionation fractions. And finally, repopulation or growth of cells between courses of conventionally fractionated radiation. This can take six to eight weeks and has a large effect, but the growth of cancer cells during SBRT or SRS is not a large concern. And the same surviving fraction curve following these different R's of radiobiology can be shown graphically here for a single, um, uh, well, as, a, as in a summary slide, cell surviving fraction is shown as a function of hours between two single doses of radiation. Initially, the radiation given with no time between is very effective. The more time between the fractions, the more time for repair. And this is sublethal damage repair by definition. If you allow even more time between the fractions, you're allowing time for redistribution of cells in the cell cycle or reassortment. And so you get a sparing, I'm sorry, as the, as the cells are synchronized and become, move into the sensitive phase of the cell cycle, then you, you get more cell killing. And then it becomes, uh, as you move even further out, uh, then you get sparing. And then obviously, if you wait too long between fractions, then repopulation can occur and the radiation is not as effective. And Dr. Brown, we have a question in the chat. This is asking, what is the most sensitive phase of the cell cycle? We talked about the least sensitive where the uh, G1 and S phases, but what, in your opinion, what's the most sensitive phase? Yes, the, the most resistant is G2M. Uh, the most, I'm sorry, the most sensitive phase in the cell cycle is late G2M because there's no time for repair. And those silly cells uh, should stop and should repair their damage. But if they're so pushed into mitosis, they die. The most resistant phase of the cell cycle is S phase, where the DNA is open. The cell is, is duplicating its DNA. And so the DNA is, is open and available and repair is most efficient. And so uh, the most resistant part of the cell cycle is S phase. As far as the potential impact on hypofractionation, uh, reassortment doesn't really play and repopulation does not. Uh, but repair, reoxygenation, and one I haven't spoken about, the intrinsic radiosensitivity uh, play a part. And you could imagine that intrinsic radiosensitivity um, is the, the basic uh, response that a cell has to radiation. Conventional wisdom states that all mammalian cells have about the same intrinsic radiation sensitivity. One to two gray 
is enough to reduce surviving fraction to 37% of what it was. And amazingly, all mammalian cells are similar. However, under hypofractionation or high dose conditions, uh, single fraction or multiple fraction, uh, there's some evidence that cells, different cells may respond differently. And this is an area of active research. So we'll stop and take a question. Great. General, uh, shall I give it to you, Ben? No, uh, it, go ahead, go ahead. Generally, the sparing effect during dose fractionation increases with increasing time between fractions, ignoring uh, uh, the details. <laughs> Uh, under certain irradiation conditions, if we don't ignore those details, an increase in the time between fraction results in decreased cell survival. So the question to the audience is, why does this occur? And you, should, and you should see in your uh, screen now the poll. So as, as Dr. Brown is about to say before I interrupted him, is it reassortment, uh, repopulation, repair, reoxygenation, or adaptive response that leads to decreased cell survival under certain conditions when we increase the interval between fractions? And please take a moment to put in your answer. Good. We have about 200 responses now. If you're not sure, that's okay. All the responses are anonymous, so put in your best guess, and we will review the group results. Okay, I'll give five more seconds. Three, two, one, zero. Okay, so here are the results. Dr. Brown, can you see that okay? Yes, perfect. So the actual answer is A, reassortment of cells in the cell cycle which might be confusing because I also called it redistribution of cells in the cell cycle. And uh, repopulation, uh, yes, indeed, that can cause a sparing effect. Um, and uh, repair, no. Reoxygenation, uh, well, I, I can see why some people would, would think repair and reoxygenation and even adaptive. Uh, but the answer is that under certain circumstances, you can get sparing because of reassortment and redistribution. Great. We had uh, two other questions. One is, does hypofractionation still have a effect with cells with high alpha beta? Oh, yeah. Great question. So... In my mind, the beta is the repair capacity. And so the larger the beta or the smaller the alpha beta, uh, the more cells capacity. And the question is, if you have a large alpha beta, is repair still important? And yes, it certainly is, but not as important. And if you plot the total dose as a function of the dose per fraction, for different tissues that where uh, it takes a total dose under different fractions to cause some biological response, whether that's necrosis of normal tissue or whether that's tumor control, some biological response or an ISO effect. The importance of repair is determined by the steepness of the slope. And even though you might have a large alpha beta ratio, there's still a slope to that curve. And so yes, uh, repair is still important, although not as important. And typically those tissues that, that repair is important are late responding normal tissues uh, like brain. Uh, and those have an, a small alpha beta whereas rapidly proliferating tissues where uh, you don't have time for repair, such as skin, gut, 
bone marrow. Uh, these cells are rapidly proliferating, and repair is not so important because there is. Okay, thank you. And then we have another good question from Maya Mayali. It says, when we pause treatment due to radiotoxicity, how does this affect repopulation activity in the patient? Cells, although damaged, are divided. Uh, uh, that's a great question and one that depends on the time of uh, how long you wait and the time of treatment, That uh, depending on if it's early on uh, or late in the treatment. And so I'm hesitant to give an answer that's definitive uh, because it really depends on the condition. Mm -hmm. And for some cells where repopulation is more of an issue, like fast-growing squamous cells, that's going to be more dangerous compared to slower-growing cells like prostate cancer. Great point. These are great questions. Anderson asks, in protracted treatments, so like long treatments, what is the best strategy to be able to compensate the dose? Can alteration of fractionation be considered? In other words, can we hypofractionate despite starting under a standard fractionation to compensate and achieve the therapeutic objective? I, I know see. of studies that have looked at that question, mm -hmm. but it's very interesting. Certainly testable in a normal model and uh, certainly has large implications, but I have no information to answer that. Great. Well, they say that the, the sign of an expert isn't someone that knows everything. It's someone who knows what isn't known. So that's great. That a good question for future studies. We have a question from Dr. Zaragoza, uh, and then we'll probably move on after one more question. Is there a threshold dose when using SBRT to cause reactivation of the immune system that is involved in causing cell damage or indirectly having a therapeutic effect? But maybe we'll get to this, yeah. Yes, so I will say tentatively, uh, there's evidence of that and I will be presenting that in the next section. Okay, wonderful. We will, uh, okay, last one. Alejandro asks, how do mechanisms of DNA repair like non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination be affected by hypofractionation? So I don't know how the specific uh, mechanisms of DNA, of double strand break DNA repair are affected by high dose radiation other than the high dose radiation um, will certainly cause uh, double strand breaks, which would be repaired uh, to some extent by these mechanisms. So other than uh, the time involved, that if you give time between fractions, uh, you get much more repair than when you give all the radiation at once. And so I would answer that the mechanisms of double strand break repair are less important at the high dose single fraction. Great, thank you. I'll let you continue now. <laughs> okay. So in summary, we've, we've re I have summarized the, the four or maybe five R's of radiobiology. Repair, which happens within hours. Reassortment or redistribution of cells in the cell cycle, which instead of decreasing radiation damage, if the the timing is right, it actually increases radiation damage. And that happens on the order of days that cells divide about once every day. Uh, Reoxygenation, which can happen on the order of hours to days. And then repopulation, which is more like weeks slash months. And finally, uh, radiosensitivity or adaptive adapt, adaptation to uh, radiation exposure. In the next section, I want to cover the biology of high-dose radiation. So as you know, high-dose radiation exposure is gaining momentum because it's less cost, better patient comfort to come in for one day instead of many days, or a few days instead of many days. 
and some would say some remarkable response rates. My talk focuses on brain tumors under single or multiple high dose fractions. So there's level three evidence that adults with newly diagnosed solid brain metastases that are amenable to SRS, which is defined as less than three centimeters maximum diameter and producing a minimal less than one centimeter midline shift mass effect, um, that there's a benefit. This is from Linsky et al. in 2010, comparing whole brain radiation to single dose. The questions that arise are, why does it work? If tumor hypoxia is a problem, and whenever tumor hypoxia is measured, it looks like it exists in, in human tumors as well as animal tumors. So hypoxia can reduce the response rate of radiation by a factor of two or three. And so how can this high dose where you're not allowing for reoxygenation work? That's a question. And if fractionated radiation strategies overcome tumor hypoxia by the process of reoxygenation, uh, which is um, one of the, the R's of radiobiology, then maybe this could answer why it works so well, but even single fraction seems to work well. So how can this be? Well, the evidence, although anecdotal, suggests that when melanoma or renal cell carcinoma or anaplastic thyroid cancer are irradiated under a fractionated scheme, uh, they don't respond well. We consider these resistant tumors to radiation. Yet when these same tumors spread to the brain and are treated with SRS under the same biologically effective dose, uh, they melt away. And Jimmy Carter is a good example of that with melanoma. So a question to the audience, do you think that there's a threshold dose that exists above which radiation is more effective at killing cells? Another way to say the same question, do you think that this high dose single fraction radiation is more effective than single dose for the same biologically effective dose. There's no right or wrong answer. This is just what you think. Okay, you should see the poll now and please take a moment to complete it. And there was another great question in the meantime from Soleil. Um, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Steve, you might have to share your screen again. I think one of our participants accidentally stole the floor. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Nice try, Luis, but you can't stop us. <laughs> so there was a great question by Soleil that was asking, you know, here we're giving a higher dose per fraction. How does this work out that we're still uh, able to have a good therapeutic ratio between tumor damage and sparing normal tissue? And the key is, Yes, we're prescribing a higher dose per fraction, but we still want our OARs, our normal tissue, to get lower dose per fraction. Um, and this is where steep dose fall off really comes into play, where good treatment planning so that you're able to deliver high dose per fraction, but when you actually measure the dose per fraction that the healthy tissues are getting, it's, it's not so high and it's still in a safe threshold. So it's, it's, you know, every kind of cell tissue is susceptible to the damage if the dose is high enough. So really what makes this possible is the technology and it advances in treatment planning technique. Great. And great, we have 400 responses. I'm going to end the poll. It looks like 75% said yes and 25% said no. Great. Well, I'll try and convince you one way or the other in the next few slides. So if we can understand uh, why SRS works so well, then we could optimize the treatment parameters, the radiation dose, the number of fractions, 
the dose per fraction. And if there's some biology going on, we could exploit the, that using uh, drugs. So there are a number of proposed explanations that have been tested in animal models and also uh, humans to try and explain why it seems SRS or multiple single or multiple fraction high dose works under some conditions so well. And I'll run through these. Uh, I'll give you the, the uh, rationales behind these. The first is tumor vessel sensitivity to radiation. Another is chronic anoxia days after radiation. Maybe it's the immune system that's being primed. There are those in the field that say there is no new biology that's needed to explain the response. And finally, other explanations. So the first of these, can endothelial cell sensitivity to radiation explain the sometimes remarkable responses that are seen? Zibi Fuchs and Richard Klosnick at Sloan Kettering and also team have identified a molecular process whereby endothelial cells die after a, radi a high dose radiation exposure by a pathway that's apoptosis, but not through P53 mediated apoptosis. This complicated figure shows that ceramide and not P53 is involved in the process. And the key molecule is this acid sphingomyelinase. When they added this key protein to tumor cells, they found uh, that the, the tumor volume um, increased, uh, that is radiation was not effective. Uh, uh, I said that wrong. When, when the protein was added to the cancer cells, they found that uh, they got a growth delay, that the uh, tumor volume as a function of time after radiation uh, went down. And when the tumors were knocked out of this sphingomyelinase uh, protein, then the tumors were not damaged and uh, grew. And so they identified this pathway as being critical. And the dose here was high enough uh, that they said it only happens at a high dose. However, they also show that this effect occurs in normal tissue. And so that doesn't explain why there might be a differential effect between tumor and normal tissue, which is what we're seeing with, with high dose. Okay, chronic anoxia, days after radiation, another explanation. Chang Song and Robert Griffin, both originally at University of Minnesota, and Dr. Griffin has moved to Arkansas. Uh, they showed that tumor blood flow uh, decreased late after a radiation exposure, days, a few days after, say at least one. And uh, then it stayed low. So they were actually starving cancer cells uh, because the radiation caused a decrease in blood flow. And this is a different process than the sphingomyelinase. <clears throat> when they plot surviving fraction as a function of radiation dose, if they um, irradiate a tumor, and then take the tumor, the cells out of the tumor and grow them in a dish. And they see that a number of clones survive. But if they wait one day before taking out these cells, less cells survive. And if they wait two days, even less cells survive. And the difference is large. It's, it's a log scale. And so approximately one log extra cell kill, which is significant. And if they waited three days, then they, they started to lose the effect. Now, these are studies were done in the 1970s, but they've been repeated many times by the group, and they show that it's consistent. Again, the dose has to be high. Here they show 10 gray. And the cutoff for both the Sloan-Kettering group 
and the Chang Song group is about eight to 10 gray. Unfortunately, others have not been able to replicate the tumor, the, the, the finding, unless they use very large tumors or the dose is enormous. So some questions about the applicability of that. What about the immune system? Sandra Demaria and Dr. Fermenti at uh, Sylvia Fermenti at now at Cornell, and also Ralph Weichelbaum at University of Chicago have said the immune system is key in the response to high dose radiation. That there are antigens that are expressed after a big dose of radiation. And this can explain the remarkable responses that are seen. However, <laughs> questionable, why is it just tumor and not normal tissue that you're seeing this uh, remarkable response and these antigens being expressed? And it's not 100% clear, although you may say that this is a tumor-specific effect. So lots more work needs to be done. Now, there's a group of uh, very well-respected radiobiologists that say there is no new biology that is needed. Um, Martin Brown, David Brenner, Dr. Carlson, uh, all say that there is no new biology that's needed. And they back this up by showing a lung cancer mets that are treated with radiation. Um, and so this is tumor control probability as a function of dose uh, per fraction, well, plotted as biological effective dose, whether it's a single fraction in red or three to eight fractions in blue, or even more than 10 fractions, they say a single line can be drawn through all the data uh, that says there is not a new biology that's needed. As you move to single fractions or less fractions, you don't get a change in the slope. And uh, nothing to see here. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> well, let's look more closely. If there is a dose above which the tumors respond much better, then you would expect this blue curve, which is below that critical threshold, to reflect the biology. And that at some dose, at some critical dose, uh, the cells or the tumors become more sensitive to the radiation. And so we jump up to the red line. And so on the right, you would expect that it would just be a steeper line above the critical threshold. Uh, the red curve explains the data and below the critical threshold, the blue line explains the data. So let's look again at the the data that exists and uh, plotting, trying to plot as best I can uh, lines through the data. Uh, I put the red line through the red dots and the blue line through the blue ones. And um, the question becomes, and then of course a, a green line has to be put through the, the, uh, the multi-fraction. The question is, is the red line and the blue line more steep than uh, the line that fits all the data. And unfortunately, the error bars are large and it's very difficult to come up with any uh, concrete, um, rigorous solution. I would say the data is still out and maybe we'll never know just because biology has a lot of scatter in it. And there's a lot of factors that uh, impact tumor control. So I would say this is not definitive. It's interesting, but it doesn't say that a new biology is not needed. It just says more work is needed. So let's go back to the question. Now, do you think that above some threshold, say eight to 10 gray, um, cells become more sensitive to radiation? That is tumors respond better. Uh, and so we'll put the question to the audience again and, and see if there's any change. Great. And meanwhile, we have a question from Jose Alejandro. It says, 
what would the threshold dose to generate cell damage be for the devascularization process in SRS, for instance, with multiple metastases? So my answer to that is that endothelial cells are proliferating cells. And I would expect that proliferating cells uh, don't have a large capacity for repair and have a, have a large alpha beta ratio. Consequently, I would say that they would be sensitive to radiation and that uh, the high dose would affect them without much repair. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers, but these are questions that, that could be answered in animal models, but have not yet been. Thank you. And let me see one more question. The use, maybe this is just statement, the use of steroids when you're delivering SRS can alter the biology, thinking about a decrease in edema and a decrease in the immune system. That's a great point. So particularly because the steroids are given systemically, um, you would expect that, that it would have an effect on the immune system and certainly on the pressure in the tumor, which can affect how uh, immune cells can infiltrate the tumor. Uh, that has been studied as far as I know. Great. Okay, we are going to share the results. Here we go. So last time we had 75% saying yes. This time we have 77% saying yes. And from 25% no now to 23% no. Who knows if people switch streets, but <laughs> these are the results. Yeah. And the answer is the verdict is still out. So we're all right. There are expl other explanations. One is that there's acute blood flow changes that occur in the minutes, hours after a radiation exposure. These studies were done in mice and rats, but very consistently, consistently if the dose is above 8 to 10 gray, blood flow decreases rapidly. And then over a period of, an, of a day, it slowly goes up over where it was before. And at Henry Ford Hospital, we've uh, looked at this in Detroit, oops. And, and then we've given drugs that could capitalize on this effect. The drugs are, for example, metformin that work much better under conditions of acidity and low oxygen, and we see a beneficial effect. And so many cancer patients are on drugs that could affect their tumor response because um, the drugs that for other reasons uh, do have an effect, such as met uh, ACE inhibitors, statins, uh, HDAC inhibitors, all seem to have an effect on tumor growth and also normal tissue. And so these are questions that in the future need to be answered so that because the, it impacts. I can just say at Henry Ford, we have a clinical trial just starting to look at the same, if the same changes in blood flow occur in human tumors and no results to show yet. Uh, hopefully in the next year, we'll have some. So that summarizes. So in conclusion, uh, although radiation biology has been around for 125 years, we still do not know the effects of high dose radiation completely. And uh, the future looks bright in that uh, these areas are being elucidated and uh, we'll be able to give radiation with knowledge of the biology in the near future. So in the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about flash radiation, but maybe I'll stop here and ask if we have time to to discuss this kind of extreme uh, hypofractionation condition where the dose rate is very high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I speak for the audience when I say we are interested in learning about flash radiation, uh, or at, at least uh, some of the things that you wanted to share. So 
I will make the call and say, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So uh, first question to the audience then is, do you think ultra high dose rate radiation, say 100 gray per second, is more effective than radiation delivered under conventional dose rates, one gray per second? Same dose, just a higher dose rate. Okay, try to put in your answers quickly, everyone. I'll give uh, 10 seconds, five seconds, three, two, one. Okay, so early survey shows 75% saying yes and 25% saying no. Okay, well, let's see. Obviously, Flash has received a lot of attention because of these anecdotal cases in small animals, zebrafish, cells in a dish, um, cats, dogs, and uh, pigs, and one human that show the tumors respond the same, but normal tissue is spared. Obviously, the advantages are if you could give the radiation in a very short time, it would be even more convenient for patients, but you better know what dose you're giving because it's given all at once and in a very short time and you have no backup. So, um, so I was going to uh, very quickly summarize the effect on tumors, the effect on normal tissue, three possible, possible mechanisms, and the testable hypotheses. The group in Lausanne, Switzerland, and the radiobiologist is, was, uh, has shown that in a number of, of systems that tumors respond the same, but normal tissue is spared. And this was a 27 gray, even 14 months later, normal chem. And similarly, in um, a pig model, um, under conventional radiation, uh, horrible damage spared under flash condition. This shows the dosimetry from their paper. More recently, they've had a follow-up paper that shows uh, late effects are uh, not so great. And this is because they say their fields are larger. So, and their dose is certainly higher. So 30 gray instead of the 27 showed necrosis of the bone. And also in the pig model, when they used a larger field uh, and a, a slightly higher dose, they show late damage. So I would say we're excited about the potential, but we're very cautious about the complications. So what are the uh, mechanisms? I'll go through these very briefly. I'll say that on a, on a molecular level, oxygen diffuses a certain distance, and that the flash effect conventionally is thought to be due to consuming all the oxygen in the field at the time of radiation so that the cells become hypoxic and therefore spared. Why there's a differential effect between tumor and normal tissue cannot be explained by the oxygen effect. Some say that the repair is different, that you get a different mode of repair under uh, high, ultra high dose rate exposures. A group in Iowa says everything can be explained by iron. That if there's iron in the field and there's more iron in cancer, so they say, then when radiation interacts at this ultra high dose rate, a new chemistry, well, not new, but Fenton chemistry occurs with more damaging free radicals. And that's why tumors respond better than normal tissue, which doesn't have iron. Lamoli in California says there's less hydrogen peroxide that occurs under the high dose rate radiation. And uh, others say it's a process of senescence. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll share the slides, but I won't go through in detail. This is the oxygen effect 
and this is ancient history. Uh, C.C. Ling in the 1960s through 80s and Howard Michaels showed this. The repair could be uh, an effect and that was our in 2011. The Iowa group showing the importance of iron and the difference in free radicals that form under flash and conventional conditions. This is the group by Lamoli uh, showing that hydrogen peroxide um, is more important under flash conditions and finally senescence. Um, so there are testable hypotheses under each of these conditions. We can look at iron, we can look at oxygen, we can give extra oxygen and see if the effect changes. Lamoli has done that. He's had the animals breathe carbogen and found that he gets rid of the flash effect, which you would not expect because oxygen, radiobiological oxygen is very low levels, three millimeters, not like a physiological hypoxia. And so I was surprised to see those results, but yet they're published. Um, and we can give sulfhydryl groups, which is the major defense that a cell has, and see how that affects flesh and normal tissue. So, and the senescence issue can be addressed uh, head on. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that there is tremendous potential if flash exists. The field is in its infancy, um, and we need a source of flash in order to do these studies. Uh, so, and those are only available at a few places. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to whet your appetite to the area of flash and say, this is the ultimate extreme of hypofractionation and if given at high dose. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really enjoyed your lecture. And without further ado, I'm just going to dive into some of these questions that we have. So Atacilio um, asks, you know, what about the late effects of flash? I think we're still learning about that. Yes, absolutely. This recent paper by the Switzerland group is a real eye opener. They did use higher doses and they used six MeV electrons. The depth dose for six MeV electrons has a maximum dose at about a centimeter or maybe a little bit more. And in some of their studies, they used a buildup dose, uh, a buildup uh, bolus of about a half a centimeter. They used half to one centimeter, but in some cases, it's half a centimeter, which obviously is not ideal. And so maybe their effects were because of inadequate dose. Um, it's certainly a concern and warrants further study before moving to humans. Although I must say one patient with mycosis fungoides, T cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, was treated with flash with good results. Um, so, and also the, the group at Cincinnati uh, recently concluded a flash study. And again, toxicity was low. Doses were much lower uh, under those conditions. Um, the field is moving quickly and uh, the concern is there, uh, especially late effects. Wonderful. We have two other very good questions. Some of the centers that we work with are very busy and maybe they're treating patients seven days a week. Is it okay to use hypofractionation seven days a week? Or is that weekend break very important? So the conventional wisdom, so the radiobiological data would suggest that that would be better. <laughs> that if, if you worked on weekends, uh, that there was, there was a benefit. And the reason in the US and Canada and elsewhere they don't treat on weekends is not from a radiobiological standpoint, but from a, a convenience standpoint. So at least from a radiobiologist, the answer is it would be better to treat on weekends with uh, the reason time is given between fractions currently is a concern for safety. Let's see what happens after the first fraction and you know we'll wait a few days for reoxygenation to occur. But from a radiobiological standpoint, there's no reason uh, other than 
just that. Great. And then we had a really good question from German Chavez. Uh, this is very astute, but are the principles that we spoke about in the first part of the lecture, um, talking about treatments with doses not as high as SBRT SRS, where there's a really, you know, hot spot. And so an example of a high dose perfraction, but without big hot spots would be like breast when we do fast forward, you know, 3D tangents or short course rectal where we're doing 25 and five, but just, uh, just again, 3D conformal radiation. So the four or five hours of radiotherapy repair, which occurs on the order of one to two hours, should not have a huge effect if the dose is given, you know, in a, say in a single fraction. Once you have days between fractions, then, then repair comes into play. Uh, the same can be said for redistribution of cells in the cell cycle, where we're talking about a day. If you have different fractions, then you would expect that the first dose would kill cells in the most sensitive part of the cell cycle, G2M. Those in S would move, they would be spared, and they would move into the more sensitive phase of the cell cycle on the order of 12 hours to 24 hours. And so we would expect that, yes, that the, the fractionation would matter. Repopulation, not so much, and reoxygenation, I think, is questionable. But with a day in between, you would expect new blood vessels to grow and some reoxygenation to occur. The big unknown is the intrinsic radiation sensitivity, where there's some evidence that high dose radiation has a bigger impact. And we just don't know the answer to that at this point. Great. We had a good question privately. Can you give hypofractionation two treatments a day? with a six hour break in between? Yeah, great question. So again, uh, you would e expect that, that the, the R's of radiobiology would impact that. Uh, and so redistribution of cells in the cell cycle might play a bigger role. Uh, and you might expect it to be, to give a little bit of a benefit. Um, you lose the benefit of uh, waiting to see what one fraction does by giving it twice in the same day. And you also lose a bit of the convenience that the patient has to be there for that length of time. And so I, I guess you have to weigh those. Radiobiologically, there isn't a huge advantage doing it in the same day to doing it in multiple days. And one other question for brachytherapy, high dose rate, um, how is the normal tissue repair between fractions? Yeah, that's a great question. So with high dose rate brachytherapy, um, the doses are enormous. You know, doses close to the seeds are, are incredibly high. And if indeed there's a new biology that's needed to explain what happens at high dose, you could imagine that ultra high dose even more so. So I don't know that that's been studied uh, well enough for me to answer other than to say you would expect the same biology to occur at above that threshold. And, and so with caution in mind, what has worked dictates what uh, should be done without deviating too far from what has been shown to be safe. Great. And I'm not sure if, if we know if, if this is a radiobiologist question, what do you do when the linear accelerator stalls for any reason during treatment? Uh, I can only answer that. Yeah, I, I can only answer that from a, an animal, mouse and rat point of view. So that's probably not going to help you. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm sure that could happen. And uh, it's happened to me while treating. <laughs> uh, um, then there shouldn't be any reason to continue the treating um, with a break between. Uh, in other words, a small break in time bet between two fractions should have the same impact if the dose is the, the total dose is the same. Great. 
Okay, and then one more question. Audience is very interested about lattice. So can we assume these same principles with lattice radiation? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that's outside my area, but again, uh, an area of, of uh, intense interest. And my goodness, if, if you get, if the, the spatial distribution matters, which it seems it does, then uh, this could have huge implications. And um, I can't really answer that with any authority. Mm -hmm. And then regarding cell death curve with respect to radiation dose, is it advisable to apply hypofractionation in the first phase of treatment and conventional dose um, in the reduction for a better effectiveness of tumor death? Mm, that's probably a good question to ask the clinicians rather than me. As far as uh, laboratory work, I know of no information that could uh, elucidate or enlighten me mm -hmm. on that effect. Great. Well, these have been amazing questions. Like, you know, power of the team. Thank you for bringing all your bright brains and minds. Uh, I feel like we all learned a lot today.